Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you this morning. Uh, thank you, John, also for that lovely story. John said he got his inspiration from finding my face on, uh, on uh, Google. So I don't know how my face related to the story, but I, I think it's a compliment. So thank you very much, John. Uh, also, while we were talking about another mate of his said, oh, my kids will up, be up the front there as well. I'm going to stuff them full of lollies, so they'll be the hyperactive ones at the front. So was the bloke beside you, the little kid beside you, was that the lolly guy? No, uh, my son. Oh, <laughs> Okay, chip off the old block. You'll be very proud. And so it's, it's very good. No, thank you. Thank you very much for your welcome. It's, uh, it's lovely to be with you here this morning. Uh, I'm going to start our program just with a prayer, and then I'll start with a video straight after that. Uh, and then we'll get into the uh, program proper. Father in heaven, we give you all the praise and thank you for your love, your goodness toward us, your grace, your mercy, uh, your incredible sacrifice for us. That in Christ we live and move and have our being. And regardless of who we are on this planet, whether we are uh, someone that knows you or do not know you yet, you are very close to each one of us. And we just pray, Father, for your blessing upon us. May your spirit work amongst your people this morning and speak through me as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ didn't avoid the suffering. He didn't avoid the persecution. Though he ushered in the very kingdom of God, he was persecuted and executed for it. In this world we will face tribulation, but you promise you'll be right here with us. And he said to his followers, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And to this day, all over the world, they still do. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus if our God is for us. We are not alone. But Jesus promised more that those who suffer for his name's sake would not be forgotten, not by God, and not by the family of God. Voice of the Martyrs was founded by a persecuted Christian as well. Richard Wormbrand reached out for Christ to the Nazis in the early 1940s when they came into his native Romania. He felt a calling to reach out to atheists for Christ. He prayed for opportunities to share Christ with the Russians as well. And when the Soviet communists entered into Romania in 1944, they came right to his doorstep. Richard boldly witnessed to them as well. And just as Jesus promised, they hated him for it. He was arrested and sent to prison for a total of 14 years, often in solitary confinement, often tortured. Through it all, he held on to his love for God and committed to witness for Christ in word and deed, even to his torturers. In 1967, Richard, now free from jail and out of Romania, founded an organization committed to sharing the stories of others who, like him, were being jailed persecuted, tortured, or killed for their faith. He often quoted Hebrews 13.3, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. That organization today is operating in 68 countries around the world, in regions that are dangerous, in countries that are restricted, reaching out through persecution response, through Bible distribution, and through frontline ministry. That organization is committed to stand with their persecuted family by saying, we will not let them suffer in silence. We will not let them serve alone. From the love of Jesus, if our God is for us, we are not alone. Nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus, if our God That organization, Voice of the Martyrs. We will share their stories with the world. We will mobilize the body of Christ to stand together with brothers and sisters who face persecution wherever it happens. We will serve persecuted Christians through practical and spiritual assistance. And we will carry on the mission of the one who called us, Jesus Christ, who said the kingdom of God is at hand.
Uh, what I'm going to offer you this morning is to sign up to our newsletter. We do want to be a voice for the martyrs, for the persecuted. Has anybody heard a voice of the martyrs before today? Oh, quite a few. Okay, we're not quite the whisper of the martyrs then. There's a few that have heard about it. Fantastic. What I want to make available is if you sign up to our newsletter and Regent has got clipboards, one for each of the rows, I guess this one here can then just flow to the back. Uh, I want to offer you just a free resource if you want to sign up, uh, entirely com uh, you know, up to you. You can either get the movie Tortured for Christ, it's in DVD format, although I don't know how many people still have DVD players, but it's available. If you don't want a DVD, when you want to watch it, let me know, I can tell you where you can find it online to stream it. If you're a reader, then I'd like to offer you the book Tortured for Christ, but I actually have a better book, I have a hardcover here, and it's uh, the story of Richard Wormbrand, the founder of Voice of the Martyrs. And it's called The Complete Story. So it's uh, more than just a Tortured for Christ book. That's available. You can choose one or the other. If you've read the book, seen the movie, maybe you want to uh, read another book. This one's called Hearts of Fire. It's a story of eight women in the underground church uh, who have suffered persecution, including Richard Wormbrandt's wife, Sabina Wormbrandt. It's a little bit more hard-hitting than some of the others. So Richard uses quite circumspect language, although you get a good picture of what he went through in communist prison. But that's another option. So you can choose any one of these three. Just come and see me at the end of the table as you head out the back. My wife will probably, hopefully, help me. And uh, we'd love to give you these resources just simply for signing up. How many people here like a good movie? Okay, some of you don't. I'm going to ask a question later for those that didn't put up their hand. Um, how many of you like a good movie that's a good length? Do you prefer a long, good movie or a, a short, good movie? Long, long, good movie. Uh, I heard more long than short. So does that mean I can give you a long sermon? Ah, <laughs> oh, okay, right, right. Well, I've got an agreement with you. I, I realize that some people have worked hard this week, and I can even see some people looking a bit dopey, you know, while we were even just watching the five-minute video. So my agreement is if more than 2% of you start looking dopey through the service, I'm going to just call it the benediction and we'll, we'll go home. Is that all right? While you seem interested, I'll go a little bit longer. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I will, I'll keep a track of time. So our history for Voice of the Martyrs, Richard Wormbrand survived 14 years in imprisonment in communist Romania. So when the Nazis rolled out, the communists rolled in. Within three years, he was captured and treated severely, tortured. You can go online and see holes and marks in his neck and his back and everywhere where they tortured him over the years. By the way, this sermon is PG, so parental guidance recommended. But after John's story this morning, I felt a little bit more comfortable with sharing what I'm going to share with you. Um, yeah. Now, he was in solitary confinement for three years. Now, are there any introverts in the house? Any introverts? Only one. Well, that's typical. You know, introverts don't respond to any questions. Have you ever heard that? You know, they'll never put up their hands. Any extroverts? Well, of course. Anyway, so introverts think, oh, solitary confinement, a whole month by myself, fantastic. But it doesn't quite, doesn't quite work that way for, for introverts. We are made social creatures, and even introverts need to have a social interaction. They need the company of others. You know, Adam was actually allowed to see his need of a mate. You know, he named all the animals, male, female, male, female. He goes, well, where's, where's the rest of me, you know? And he was able to see his need before God actually provided so he could enjoy it and appreciate it so much more. So we are made to be social. But he spent three years in solitary confinement. And the challenge for him was that they were deprived of light, deprived of sound. Um, he didn't know it was night or day. He was like 14, yeah, 14 meters underground, or 9 meters underground. And only had this little breathing hole that came into his cell. And... Uh, he lost all track, couldn't concentrate long enough even to remember a Bible text. And he was a pastor. And all he could say sometimes for his prayer is, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. That's all he could pray. And so while in prison, a lot of them actually forgot a lot of Bible texts. It's not until he was actually released that he, the Bible text came back to him very quickly. But difficult to, uh, to go into solitary confinement, and there's many different types of so, um, psychological tortures that are inflicted on people through... Um, solitary confinement and that kind of isolation. So Voice of the Martyrs globally, we have about 16, 18 offices around the world. We operate in 68 restricted and persecuting countries, typically through that 1040 window where uh, Adventist World Radio does a lot of their um, broadcasting. And you can see there's China, communist, India, uh, Hindu. We also have places there that are Buddhist. 
And then we get into, of course, um, Islam, which is a great persecuting power at the moment, right through into Africa. And then you get into um, South America and also Central America. It gets a little bit complicated there. That's um, sometimes animism there, uh, some communism, sometimes mingled with it, or atheism. But in Mexico, it's Christian on Christian persecution at times. And if you want to know more about it, I'll explain it. But uh, that's what's happening in Mexico. Voice of the Martyrs is founded on a text. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. And it starts with the word, remember. Now, the Bible, if you look at the King James, uses the word remember 144 times. More modern translations, around 165 times. And the word remember there is the Greek word meneskamai. Meneskamai means to intentionally and actively remember something. It's interesting that God often wants to remind us of the things that we tend to forget. You know, we have busy lives and uh, even, uh, you know, what's one of those uh, remembers that we as Seventh-day Adventists celebrate? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the majority of the Christian world has actually forgotten that day, haven't they? Uh, by the way, I speak at uh, many denominational churches, Baptists and uh, Pentecostal churches and whatever. I think last time I actually spoke and I saw um, Miss Petrie. We were at a Baptist church in Adelaide uh, when I spoke last time. You were in the audience there. So I get to uh, visit many, many, many churches. But this is one where they typically have lost the significance of the Sabbath. So we are to remember, but remember what? The prisoners. And we've got to so closely associate with that text that we, when we remember the prisoners, we've got to think of ourselves as if we are in prison with them. Even those who are mistreated, those who are tortured, since we ourselves are in the body also. Now, what does it mean to be in the body? Of course, we've got a physical body. Uh, you know, some of you are overworked this week and you're a little bit tired at the moment. We know what it feels to feel tired. We know what it's like to be a little bit hungry. We know what pain feels like. But it's more than that. It's actually talking about the, the spiritual body, the body of Christ, Christ being the head of the body. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us that if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers with it. Now, I'm going to tell you a little quick story. It happened in our house uh, last year or maybe two years ago. My wife has given me permission to tell this story. It's a romantic story. It's a love story, really. But my wife, I was busy working inside, and my wife decided she wanted to go and lie in the sun and do a bit of reading, but uh, she likes reading off her iPad or watching little things. Instead of asking me to just take the sun chair, the deck chair, and just put it out in the sun for her, she decides she'll pick it up, put her iPad on there, and as she shimmied around one of the pillars walking on the cement slab, uh, she twisted the, the, um, the bed, and the, the iPad slipped off. Now, I don't know, how much is an iPad? A thousand bucks? I can't remember what an iPad is worth. But fortunately, to break its fall, her little toe got in the way. And the iPad was actually fine. Challenge was, her little toe hit, got the impact. And I heard her going, oh, 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 and complaining. And now, after a little while, as a good husband, I thought I'd better go and see what's wrong. Because she's uh, awfully noisy outside. And uh, I thought I'd better go and help. So I said, look, what have you done? She goes, oh, this iPad, right on the edge of the iPad, on the corner, it hit a little toe. So I go, what, do you want me to bring ice? Yep, I'll bring ice off, ice to toe. Anyway, when I got to see your toe, it was actually blown up. It was almost twice the size. It started swelling very quickly, so there's a lot of bruising there and, and, and a little bit of blood. Um, I iced it for about half an hour. I take the ice away. She complains again. Put the ice on. She's a little bit better. And I go, Phew, okay, well, look, maybe you've broken your toe. I might have to take you to the hospital just to get checked out. Now, um, There'd be a few married couple here because I was amazed at how many children there are here. You guys are very advanced, you know, you're, you're actually growing the church in the natural way. And uh, I've heard about flow to convert, you know, but this is just taking it to a whole other level. And, uh, but anyway, there's a lot of children. So when, when my wife and myself got married, I actually picked her up and carried her across the threshold. Anybody else do that? No romantics. Normally there's one or two old fellas, you know, that normally said, oh yeah, we did that back in our day. No? Okay, well that's a tradition. Uh, where I come from, that's a tradition. When you walk across the threshold there, you open the door, whether it be a hotel or your house, you pick your bride up and carry across, and it's all exciting, you know. Uh, luckily we do it when we're young and buff, and your wife is nice and trim and that, because, you know, as time progresses, uh, no, no, as time progresses, we get a little bit weaker as men. That's what I mean. That's what I mean, right? <laughs> Anyway, so uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to have to carry my wife, and uh, I'm not so buff as I used to be. Um, I've got to carry her to the car, which is a bit of a distance away, so I open the gate, I open the car door, get it all ready, it's in the garage, and uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to carry it to the, and then I'll take her. So um, 
I pick her up, and I don't know if I made some noise. She goes, oh, I might have gained a pound or two since we got married. Uh, anyway, so I, I take her to the car. We take her to the accident and emergency, and sure enough, um, they do an x-ray, and she has broken her toe. A big splinter, a big chunk of that little bone at the front there split off to the front, and then there's a splinter to the left and the right. Now, the, the, the story, the purpose of the story is not about how strong I was to pick her up. The purpose of the story is this. Why was it when the littlest, the smallest member of her body got injured, her tongue cried out? The iPad didn't fall on the tongue. Why was it that her eyes welled up with tears, her eyes weren't affected? Why was it that when the little toe, the smallest member, it looked like a knee and a hip was out of joint, she was sort of walking like this? It's only the little toe. Well, the point of that is, is when one part of the body suffers, the whole body goes out in sympathy. And that's really what this text is saying, that we are in the body also, and we are to remember those imprisoned as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, because we are in the body also. So what does persecution look like? I can share the data, which is uh, for the last 12 months. Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. Uh, other religions do have some form of persecution, but nothing like Christianity. 240 million Christians live in areas where persecution is severe. It's not if, but when you will get persecuted, and that's why there's underground churches and in many places deep underground churches where people are in hiding. And you may not even know if your neighbor is a Christian or not because it's so dangerous to share it in some places like North Korea. There's also another 400 million Christians living in areas where they are at risk. So opportunistic things, uh, threats, or maybe times when there's like Christian festivals, you know, like Christmas or, or Easter. Quite often people will get targeted in uh, Islamic countries, for example. There's an increase in suicide bombings and churches being uh, targeted uh, around those times as well. But we are told by Open Doors on the story of Brother Andrew. Um, Brother Andrew was uh, someone that we read about under the book called God's Smuggler when I was at an Adventist primary school back in the, in the 70s. And I remember this incredible story about this guy and how miraculously and how often he smuggled Bibles into the communist world. But uh, Open Doors last year told us up to October last year, 340 million Christian believers face persecution for Christ. Now, that can be all forms of persecution. It can be from mild to severe, uh, you know, from discrimination or harassment, beatings, kidnappings, rape and forced marriage, forced reconversions, imprisonment, torture, and even death, and, and, and many more. And biblically speaking, we can see that, you know, um, persecution can take on ridicule, harassment, discrimination, attacks, imprisonment, torture, and martyrdom. And each of those texts are worth um, looking at in detail, but we don't have time today. But I want to just bring it down. You know, when you talk about millions, you talk about statistics, uh, you lose the actual sense of the individuals, the mums, the dads, the father, the mothers, the brothers, the sisters, the children who are suffering persecution, who are stolen from families and at the age of 12 and 13 are forced to get married and forced to convert from Christianity to Islam, as happens in Pakistan quite a lot. So on a daily basis, what does that look like? 13 Christians today, while we're speaking to each other, 13 Christians will die for their faith today. Twelve Christians will be unjustly arrested, detained, or imprisoned. Five Christians will be kidnapped. And we are now on a 15-year high. It's grown year on year for the last 15 years to levels that have been unprecedented. We operate in uh, 68 countries, as I said. Last year, Voice of the Martyrs Australia operated in 28 countries with projects. We had some of our other uh, fellow uh, ministries around the world help support some of those projects. And we completed 128 projects. The year before was 155, but we did a lot larger projects this time. So we've got areas of support as Bibles and literature, frontline ministry, families of uh, martyrs, families of those imprisoned, VOM Medical, and then the VOM Ministry Fund. But basically, if you look at the first four, we've set it up so that most, all the money we possibly can can go to the field. Our whole focus is on helping those who are persecuted. So if a dollar is given to Bibles and Bibles distribution, a dollar is used. None of it's used in uh, it administration. The same for frontline ministries, families of martyrs, and VOM Medical. The VOM Ministry Fund, however, does pay my wages. I used to volunteer for Voice of the Martyrs. At that time, I was working for 3ABN as the manager for 3ABN Radio. And uh, subsequent to that, I've got employed by them now. Prayed a simple prayer. Lord, all my friends are Seventh-day Adventists. How can I meet other Christians and share what we know about the gospel? And uh, I thought maybe just a little Bible study here and there, maybe uh, you know a little house group. Well, it turned out the Lord had different ideas, and now I've become friends with the Archbishop, you know, Anglican Archbishop of uh, of, of Sydney. 
I'm meeting a lot of senior pastors of many other denominations and hopefully having an influence and breaking down some prejudice. I don't know if you've come across it, but a lot of people misunderstand Seventh-day Adventism. And I have the, the privilege of you know, dispelling some of those myths, so I praise God for that. But when it comes to Bibles, we smuggle Bibles into many countries, like Brother Andrew uh, did and started his ministry. And in secret, sometimes we do it with little microchips. Sometimes we can get it through Bible apps. But in countries now, if they catch you with a Bible on your phone, you could be arrested and even killed, like in Afghanistan, for example. You know, China. Someone spoke about China in the lesson study this morning. Unfortunately, I've got a whole presentation on China, but I, I, haven't, I wasn't going to speak on China today. But China's got the biggest printing press of Bibles in the world. Amity Press prints 25% of the world's Bibles every year. Do you think any of the people in the underground church can get their hands in the Bible? Very, very difficult. You've got to be along to the official church, which is sanctioned by the communists. The communists who do not believe in God, don't believe what the Bible teaches. And also, you can belong to that church, and you know, as long as you toe the line based on what the communists want, you won't suffer too much persecution. Although they're now starting to shut down some of these three self-patriotic movements, which uh, the, the, com the, uh, the, the Protestant arm of the communist uh, religious um, affairs bureau. If you're in a, in a three self-patriotic church, you can actually get a Bible, but it's very difficult. You've got to apply for it. They'll also decide who can get baptized. They'll also decide who can go to seminary, who gets appointed as church leaders, church elders, and so forth. And if you've been following the news from time to time, the Catholic Church has tried to compromise to appoint their own bishops, but now they're jointly appointing it with the, with the, uh, the Communist Party. And uh, I was there in, uh, in China just a few years ago, uh, not too long ago, and we met with the underground church, saw their facilities, heard the stories and how difficult it is and how people have been thrown into prison just simply for sharing the gospel. Call, they call it illegal uh, gatherings or illegal operations if you're not part of the Three self Church. But the church is growing incredibly fast there. This group of people that we met, um, they baptized 3,000 plus in the summer months just in Beijing alone, added to the church. Now, their church is not an official church. It's made up of house churches, house groups of 15 to 25 people. Once they get over 2025, 20, they split them and make them smaller so they are undetected. And they'll meet a number of times uh, a, a week and then share the gospel. So I saw handwritten Bibles. These people eat, breathe, and sleep the Word of God when they can get their hands on it. They treasure it. Now, I, I thought we may have had 10 Bibles in our, in our home. I counted the other day, we have over 20. You know, and it's, is it the supply and demand thing? You know, when there's a, a high demand and, and, and a low availability, prices go up, right? And people treasure and value it. Is it like that with the Bible? And when the Bible is plentiful and the demand is higher and it outstrips even, you know, sorry, supply is higher than the demand, is it that the perceived value drops? Is that, is that possible? Because these guys can't get their hands on it. When they get the Bible, they'll pull the binding out. They'll pull that and pull the pages out. And then they'll come and they'll share the pages around at their group meeting. So maybe it's the Gospel of Matthew. And I'll have Matthew 1 and 2. You'll have 2 and or 3 and 4. You'll have 5 and 6 and so on. Next time we meet, we'll swap. They'll handwrite it. They'll try and commit it to memory. And I've been so inspired. That's why I actually joined the movement just as a volunteer. So inspired by their devotional life, their prayer life, and their commitment to share the gospel under difficult, hostile environments. Um, and that, that's why I do what I do, just to let people know. What happens when you are in a persecuted country? The simplicity of the gospel becomes very ev evident. I call, it, I call it primitive gospel. It's no, the bells and whistles are gone. It's just what is, the, what is Christianity? Well, it's a walk with the Lord. It's a talking to the Lord. It's in prayer and constantly praying and claiming the promises in God's word and reading God's word and, and filling your mind with it. There's no prosperity gospel because you may be arrested. You may lose your job. You may not see your family again. You may lose your life. It's a very different gospel to what we have in the West in, in, some, in some churches. But in regards to our medical support, um, I just want to tell you a quick story in Indonesia. Also around uh, Easter time, uh, there was a family... They split into three. There was a mother with the two daughters. The youngest daughter was nine years old on a motorbike. The two older sons on motorbikes. And then the father with also, I think, a younger son on the motorbike. But there were 13 of these suicide bombers that targeted three different churches. And as people came out of church um, on the Easter, Easter Sunday, they detonated these bombs. Now, the mum was hiding under the shield. No one would think you'd blow up your own nine-year-old daughter. But that's what she did. And Fenny had just come out of the church and uh, she got uh, some of the bomb blasts and got burned severely. You can see the scar tissue on there. Now, that scar tissue is so tight that if she moves it, it actually cracks and, and, and rips open. You can actually see a little bit of the markings there. 
So Voice of the Martyrs through our medical fund then paid for reconstructive surgery, you know, skin grafts and so on to help her. Um, but when she came out of the church, she also had a young daughter, Clarissa, with her as well, and we supported Clarissa just to help her uh, get treated. But what a beautiful little girl uh, that went with her mum to just go and worship the Lord. Then also another story coming out of um, Indonesia. Pastor Jambre has been threatened many times by um, extremist Muslim people to not spread the gospel and to stop winning people for Christ. So he's coming home from a church service one evening on his motorbike. You know, if you've been to those countries that don't typically wear helmets. Anyways, he's coming towards uh, the light. He sees just a movement out of the side and men step out and they swing at him with the machete to take his head off. Well, he tries to duck under it. They hit him in the mouth. That knocks him off the bike. His bike goes one way. Uh, he falls down. And as he jumps to get up and run away, he tries to call for help and he can't because his whole mouth has been cut open and his jaw is hanging down. So we paid for reconstructive surgery for him as well. So that's the kind of work that Voice of the Martyrs does. Anything related to persecution, we will help with the medical bills, even if they've been mistreated in labor camps, which happens a lot for Christians. They're not quite fed enough, and many of the Christians will actually just simply die of exhaustion through the process. But um, we'll pay for them if they've been mistreated or they've got back injuries when they are actually released from these camps or even from prison. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. On the first weekend, normally it's the first Sunday um, of November, there's an international day of prayer for the persecuted church, for persecuted Christians. And we participate in that. We make uh, resources available, videos to uh, download, and even a PowerPoint presentation. Of course, it'll be on the first Sabbath for Seventh-day Adventists, like we celebrate Mother's Day and Father's Day. Um, but if you go to vom.com.au, that's our homepage, you'll find a quick link there or just add forward slash IDOP, IDOP, International Day of Prayer, and you will find some resources. Um, I'm just going to play a little clip. It goes for a few minutes, but if I play this little clip, you will see some extracts from this movie. The movie I offered you, Tortured for Christ, was released in 2018. It's about the communist years for Richard and Sabina Wurmbrandt. This movie is a prequel which means it's the years before the communist role and during the Nazi years. And it tells a story of how these hedonistic, um, pleasure-loving, atheistic um, Jews came to know Christ and become converted and fell in love with the Lord and then set up a, a ministry that is now running worldwide through a voice of the martyrs. But what they've done for IDOP, every year there's a video that comes out. They've taken extracts, just a few extracts from the movie, and the theme this year is Finding Life. You know the text in the Bible where Jesus says, He who finds his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. You're celebrating next week. You're celebrating someone that's going to go into the watery grave and be raised to newness of life. That's an example of losing a life for Christ, but actually finding it. So let me just play the, um, the video here. It runs for a few minutes. And uh, you'll see what uh, Sunday the 7th of November or Sabbath the 6th of November can be all about to pray for those who are persecuted and mistreated as we are told in Hebrews 13, 3, to remember those. In 1940, Nazi forces invaded Richard and Sabina Wurmbrand's home country, Romania. There were no safe spaces for Jews. And though Christian, Richard and Sabina were ethnic Jews. Are you afraid? Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Genesis 26. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua 8. I am. I'm kind of afraid. They are asking to see IDs. All our lives remain in our Jews only. 
с чем, блядь. Давай в этом будешь портить, да? Parte, știu că ascunzi evrei aici. Nu puteți să vă uitați, dar nu e niciun evreu aici. Perhaps you should get out if you still can. Run away? If we stay, I follow the others into prison. It will be the end of our life together. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We believe this or we don't. Richard and Sabina, like many Christians during World War II, had a choice. Lay low and hope the worst passed them by. Or get involved and be the hands and feet of Christ. All at great personal risk. I think we have to stay. We have a job to do. If they are coming, then they are coming. Let's not think of them as enemies to be feared, but rather as a mission. Like Sabina and Richard Wormbrand, today's persecuted Christians, living in hostile areas and restricted nations are bold witnesses for Christ. Choosing to give up their comfort and safety in this world in order to find a life that counts for eternity. The first request from our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters is, will you pray for me? As we pray for them to endure opposition in order to advance the gospel, may we be inspired by their example to pay any price necessary in obedience to Christ. So I've got two birds with one swat, or two flies with one swat, should I say, because the movie is coming out a week later on Sunday the 14th of November. Um, Sabina, Tortured for Christ, the Nazi Years, which is a prequel to the Tortured for Christ movie from three years ago. And uh, you can go onto our website, either vom.com.au and use the quick links, or just go to sabinamovie.com. Or if you have a smartphone, you can just scan the, uh, the QR code. We're so used to scanning QR codes now, aren't we? Um, and then it will take you straight to the, uh, to the website. And uh, we are selling tickets. Uh, there are cinemas. There's uh, 12 cinemas in, uh, in Queensland. And they're all Sunday afternoon, the 14th of November at 3.30. So Carindale and Chermside are close to you. And Pacific Fair on the Gold Coast is also another one close. And uh, so we have 40, 41 locations around Australia. Uh, most of them on that particular time and on that Sunday. So people quite often ask me, have you guys done anything in Afghanistan? I'll just go through this very quickly. But Christianity reached Afghanistan uh, by the second century. And today, if you go there, there are not any churches. There are no church buildings there. Uh, there's no indication that there's Christianity at all in Afghanistan unless you have contacts into the underground church. Now, radical Islam and violent tribal conflict make it very dangerous for Christians there. The church growth has been slow but steady. There are more than 40 ethnic groups there and tribal groups, and they've always been fighting. I mean, you go centuries, centuries back, there's always been fighting and bloodshed in Afghanistan. 
the major religion there is Islam. There's 99.8% of the people there are Islamic, and 90% of them are actually Sunni, and 10% are Shiite. And both local and national governments are highly antagonistic towards Christians. Uh, extremist groups like the Taliban, as we've seen on the news of late, and even Islamic State are very active there. Um, you can't worship openly there. It's hard to find a Bible in Afghanistan as well. And uh, to find a Bible, quite often they'll use their phones and they'll be able to access it online. But quite often it's not in their own language. So we're actually working on ways now to translate the Bibles for those people in those countries so they can uh, have the gospel and read the gospel in their own language. Now, uh, the imprisonment is not common there, but a few Christians are also imprisoned. And there are a number of Christians martyred every year in Afghanistan, but the deaths generally occur without public notice. And uh, that can even happen from family members or the community that attacks them or the government themselves as well. So I've spoken about Bibles. We also uh, have just taken over responsibility for radio and TV broadcasts and discipleship training in that area. And I want to just share with you some of the stories that have come out of Afghanistan. You know, typically if you've been watching the news for the last, uh, you could probably say the last year or so, there's been uh, two things. There's been uh, COVID on the news. COVID-related stories, like shortage of toilet paper. And then on the other side, there's been sport, right? That's basically the two things. But then for a little while there, we had COVID, Afghanistan, and sport. So in Afghanistan, the challenge was, as soon as the, um, the Americans rolled out, the government collapsed, and the Taliban took over, that the Taliban had access now to the government registry, where everybody was registered, all the citizens, they had biometric information on the people, and also their religion. And of course... Uh, just about everybody in Afghanistan previously used to be a Muslim and to convert as treason and uh, basically you get executed. So uh, they then went after the people. So these people fled and left their homes with nothing just with what they could carry and they ran off. And they, sometimes they didn't even have money, they didn't have time to go to the bank and they went into hiding and deep hiding. And some of them they tried to get out of the country, some of them were able to cross the borders into places like um, some of the other Stan, you know, some of the Stan countries, including Pakistan, although Pakistan is probably not the best place to go. Pa Pakistanis don't really want them in the country because of, they are strongly Islamic as well. And so we then tried to get some people out. We immediately identified 23 underground church leaders who had been spreading the gospel for a number of years, who were on this uh, database. And we tried to get them out. We got 10 of them out eventually. But we tried eight times to actually get them out of Kabul airport. And, you know, it was just a, a miracle within itself to get past all the checkpoints just to get to the airport. And um, they were able to get on a plane and leave just before they had that big bombing. You know, when the, they had 73 people die, 13 American soldiers and 60 of the locals. Well, we got them out on the plane just before that. But we still had another 13 people church leaders uh, and their families that we needed to get out. And that was a real struggle. So we, when it got that dangerous there, we got them into safe houses and we would move them around from time to time. In the meantime, also, because it's so difficult for women, you know, if you're a girl and you're not married yet or you've even been widowed under the age of 45, you will go onto the Taliban register and then you'll be used as a prize, as a reward for a Taliban fighter, depending on their age and that, and they will marry you off. So you don't even have uh, control over your own children. And your daughter from the age of 12, 15 onwards would be on this register. And they may just come and take them away. So you could see why it was important for them to get out of the country. So on our, on our um, system, through our uh, people on the ground, we were able to identify 200 orphans. People have uh, lost their parents. And also another 100 MBBs, Muslim background believers. We got them into Kabul. In Kabul, we got them through this, the seven checkpoints. When they get to the airport, and they get to go walk into the airport, unfortunately, the U.S. military opened fire on them. For what reason, we don't know. And there's many stories I could share with you that you would probably question yourself, unless it was for the people who we trust on the ground that told us this is actually what happened. And it became so difficult even to negotiate just with planes to, the, to leave with the Americans that finally we actually resorted to negotiating with the Taliban to get some planes off the ground, and we got more success that way. But anyway, um, these people then, when they got shot, they actually ran back into the maddening crowd. Now we've got to find safe house for 300 people. How do you get safe houses for 300 people? Um, I'll tell you the story now because it's, it's a past event. Um, is this being recorded? It is. Okay, I won't tell you everything. Um, what happens is we get them into a building. This building is a big building, and it's got a number of floors to it, and we get them into the top two floors of this building. But the Taliban actually have the rest of the building, 
That's where the headquarters are. So we have our people in a safe house actually rubbing shoulders from time to time with the enemy who's trying to kill them, but they don't know who they are. They're all dressed the same. So finally now we have to get them out. We get them to another place called Maria al-Sharif, and from there finally there were eight planes on the ground. They were able to fly them out, not only those 300, but another 100 or so, including those other 13 um, church leaders. But it's been really tough for them. You know, when they left, they had no food. And um, it was about a week and a half to two weeks for the, um, for the banks to reopen again after this big uh, kerfuffle over there and, 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 and this crisis. And when they opened up, there was no money. The banks didn't have any money. So it took us a while then to try and get money in. I remember talking to the guys from ADRA at the Pacific Division, and they were saying how difficult it was to get money. But through our contacts, we got some money in. It would just take long. One time it took a week. And these people were contacting like days before the money arrived. When's the money coming? Our guys are starving. They've got no food, you know, and the kids are starving. They haven't eaten for days. And we would get money in just to help them. And finally, when we got the money to them, they were able to then trade, buy food, buy water and so on. But these kids, some of them for two or three days had no water. And they were sick on the side as they're trying to get to the airport, only to be fired on when they got to the airport. Just a terrible, terrible circumstances. Now, also, when you, um, when you saw some of the footage, some of the people were clinging onto these planes and getting into the, uh, uh, the, you know, the wheel. What do you call those things where the wheels go in? Wheel, you know what I'm talking about, you know, where the wheels track, uh, bring, uh, come up. And some of them fell out. Uh, why would they risk their lives like this? Because it's not only the Taliban, it's also Islamic State, which is far worse than the Taliban, that they were trying to escape. The Taliban might kill you quickly. But Islamic State sometimes would torture you just simply because you are an infidel and they'll try and see if they can convert you back. And so a lot of these people actually fled and they know what the uh, Taliban and the Islamic State would do to them if they caught them, especially if they were supporters of the Australian mission there or the US mission. Uh, this photo down the bottom uh, right-hand side actually reminds me of you know, Noah's Ark when, uh, when, uh, when the floods came and people tried again. And these people are trying to get into the plane and hang on to every bit of the plane that they possibly could just to get out of the country. Terrible, terrible conditions. So what happened to some of the people have chosen to stay in, the tele, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan to share the gospel? Because if everybody leaves, then who will hear the gospel? How would you be the salt and the light that Jesus asked us to be? So we got them to a place where uh, it was a little bit safer for them. The Panjia Valley is relatively safe compared to some other areas, uh, only to have the Americans and uh, the Pakistanis then go and bomb the area because apparently there was a whole bunch of Taliban soldiers congregating there. Now, our on-the-ground um, intel couldn't verify whether that was the case or not, but that was another dangerous spot. So uh, some of the people have been able, through the high, um, the high country and the other mountains, been able to get into some of the you know, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and some of those places. But just a terrible, terrible uh, set of events. The first request we always get from Christians who are persecuted is to pray. So they go, what do we pray for? Do we pray that persecution would cease? They pray, no, pray that God will give us wisdom and boldness to spread the gospel even when we face adversity and opposition. So some of the prayer requests we've been praying for uh, since we've been working, particularly on these projects in Afghanistan, Jasmine is a Christian Hazari judge. Now, the Hazaris are one of the 40 ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And it's funny enough that the Azaris are the ones that have most responded to the gospel more than any other. So if you meet a Christian from Afghanistan, they typically are an Azari rather than some of the other ethnic groups. But during the work for the government there, she presided over cases against Taliban members, members and many of them were sent to prison. And she received death threats. The parents' house were taken over by the Taliban and they are searching for her. So she and her parents have gone into hiding. Janti is a Christian poet and advocate for women and Hazaris. Her poems feature criticism of the Taliban and their crimes. She's also had to go into hiding. Akko, we changed the names by the way, but Akko is a known Christian Afghan, um, Afghan who worked as an engineer contractor for the US. The Taliban is seeking to find and kill Akko and his family for being Christian and for their collaboration with the US forces. A couple more. Hamed was the founder of a non-government organization that employed fellow Christian Hazaris. The organization helped to oversee the building projects for the German and U.S. governments, and for 20 years they did that. And when the Taliban took over, they ransacked the organization's office, stole all the money on hand, and they're searching for Hamid and his employees. Teresa, this is a story that's been going for a while because we are not foreign to Afghanistan. We've been working in there for a while. Teresa's husband is missing. It's been more than six years without a word. It's not safe for her and her teenage daughter to remain in Afghanistan. They fear they will be forcibly married to Taliban soldiers. They are now in hiding. So we have a lot of prayer requests like that. 
And I hope many of you have taken the opportunity to sign up to get our monthly newsletter or our weekly email, which is Pray for the Persecutor. It comes out on the Thursday. Just short little uh, stories, uh, high-impact high stories typically that you can pray for. But you know, the Bible encourages us to pray with the spirit and the understanding. And this will give you the understanding to know what to pray for for those who are being persecuted. On a more positive note, this time of the year, October, November, December, we work on our Christmas care projects where we bring joy to children in restricted nations. And what we do is we send money over $30 Australian, and we have our people on the ground buy typically the um, what is needed most for those, Christ for those children there. Uh, they all get a Bible, but they normally get other bits and pieces, school supplies, clothing, hygiene items, a toy, Christmas literature, uh, Christian literature, food, educational costs, and so on are covered. So just a couple of um, testimonies on that. Our family would like to express our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation on behalf of our church for your gifts. Through your generosity and support, we were able to place a Bible in the hands of each of the children. They have never had a Bible, and they wanted it badly. I tell you, they cherish the Word of God where it's uh, in, low, uh, in, in, in low supply. Your gifts and generosity was a perfect provision for every one of them. Thank you so much. That's from a local pastor. Just one more story. We unexpectedly received these packages from God through donors from abroad. So donors here in Australia. God has fulfilled his promises. He cares for us. He is with us. You could have just brought a few things as a duty, but you didn't. Instead, you have brought the best with you to include in these packs with care and love for us. I feel the love of God through them. The wife of a pastor. So for about a dollar a day for a month, if you can sacrifice, you know, maybe you have a cup of coffee once a week or twice a week, if you sacrifice that, a dollar a day will give you $30 and uh, we'll be able to provide a child with a Christmas pack. Last year we did almost 3,700 packs. We'd like to do 10,000 this year and we're getting some good sponsorship for that. But if there are people, your first priority is your church always, right? But if there are people who want to know what they can do in regards to financial support, that's just some examples. You can care for an orphan for a day. For $5, we can get a Bible into a restricted country. And one Bible can serve five families, sometimes up to ten families. And I'm uh, telling my family that if they want to buy me a Christmas gift this year, they can just go online and pay for one of these, and we can send them a little certificate, which they can give to me as a, as a, as a Christmas gift, so we can help the people there. But Voice of the Martyrs is basically about the Lord's business. It's what Jesus told us to do. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the signs of his coming and the end of the world. Matthew 25 is a continuation of that same discourse where Jesus tells three stories. And these three stories have to do with what the church will look like and what the world would look like at the end. And in Matthew chapter 25, we read the story of the sheep and the goats. And uh, the king, which is Jesus, will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry, you gave me food. Thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me in prison, and you came to me. That's the work of Voice of the Martyrs. And if you ever wondered how you could do that, please feel free to partner with us. Most importantly, we want you to pray. But if you want to partner with us, that's great. Remember to come to the back. My wife and myself will be out there just to hand over resources if you sign up to the newsletter. For more information, you can go to our website. And also, ask yourself this question. Have you found that one thing that is more important to you than your own life. If you have found that one thing, the pearl of great price, if you have found Christ, are you also prepared to lay your life down and answer the call of Christ, whatever that may be, wherever he may take you? Because this is the example of those who are being persecuted and mistreated around the world. Pray that God will inspire you and bless you through their stories, and also that you will receive your inspiration to find that one thing that is more precious than your own life. Because he who loses his, if you find his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for Christ's sake shall find it.